Welcome everybody, wherever you are in the world. I know some of you are in America, others are in Africa, others across Europe, and Asia, and even down to the Pacific. So thank you very much for joining us in this commemoration today for Floyd McClung. I think we all received the news that Floyd passed away last Saturday. And uh, while, of course, this is a huge loss at the same time, it was a release for him from five years of suffering. Everybody knows Floyd as a big man, not just physically, but in many other ways. He has big shoes. And this evening, we're going to explore the spiritual footprint that he left behind, especially here in the Netherlands, where he and Sally lived from 1973 to 1991. We want to give honor where honor is due. And as we reflect on his legacy in this land, we recognize and Floyd an exceptional leader. Sally has, spent, has sent a special greeting to us from Cape Town, which Romke is going to read. Warm greetings to each one of you. When we left Holland, we left a big part of our hearts with you. After 18 years there, it will always be home to us in many ways. Thank you for how you loved and accepted us. Thank you for opening your homes and hearts to us. Thank you for teaching me gezelligheid. I've carried that concept with me everywhere we've lived. If you walked through our home in Cape Town, you'd see Dutch things in every single room. I even have a lamp I bought in Heerde in 1975. I often smile when I look at one of the Dutch items. They all provoke sweet memories, memories that I will savor even more now. I treasure all the memories of when Floyd, Misha, Matthew and I lived there. Before Floyd became ill, we'd been talking about taking a trip to visit Holland. We wanted to see your smiling faces again. And we also wanted to take our grandchildren to see our Dutch roots, which we, with that we tell them so many stories about. Sadly, it was not to be. But please know how much Floyd loved all of you, our dear Dutch friends. From the Ark to Heidebeck, to the Cleft, and to Samaritan's Inn, each of our homes there have special memories for us, especially sweet memories of all the people that were part of our lives. I rarely heard Floyd preach a sermon that he didn't refer to something from our years in Holland. We were so grateful for our time with you. Through the years that Floyd was sick, I got so many cards, emails, and texts from you dear ones in Holland. Thank you for standing with us on our unexpected journey. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for continuing to love us from afar. Much love and tot ziens, Sally. Floyd and Sally were only married a few weeks when they led an outreach in Trinidad, in the Caribbean. And we also have received a message from someone who was on that outreach, someone who, in her own way, is a legend within Youth with a Mission, Riona Peterson Jolly. And she sent the following message that Romke is going to read. I flew to Jamaica from for my first YOM summer of service in 1967, where I was introduced to the leaders of the outreach, Floyd and Sally McClung, wedded just a few weeks before. When the first school of evangelism was planned in Lausanne in 1970, I signed up to be a student. In 1971, I met Floyd in Afghanistan as he, as he passed through with his team on their way to India. Then it was the Ark in Amsterdam, followed by Heidebeek, Samaritans in the Cleft, Trinidad, Colorado, and finally Kansas City in 2003. I watched with amazement the increase of the gentleness and the strength of Jesus in Floyd's life, also the increase of authority as he taught. In my 30 e 
eight years of being sing single, he was to me a big, big brother. <laughs> one to whom I could always turn and his response would be one of compassion and concern. I humbly believe he was the greatest teacher God entrusted to us in our mission. And I felt the loss keenly when he moved on to other ministries. So we're now going to look at Floyd's time, uh, primarily here in the Netherlands, in three phases. The first phase is the Dilaram phase, from 1973 to 1976. The second will be the Haderbeck phase, from 1977 till 1980. And lastly, the Amsterdam phase, 1980 to 1991. And we've asked uh, several people to share and reflections and memories from those times that, um, we, that we'll be able to give perspective on their understanding of the footprint that Floyd has left behind. You've all heard the name Dilaram Houses. Uh, although Floyd and Sally had been leading this outreach and working within Youth with a Mission, um, after they came across all these world travelers out in the East, they set up the Dilaram houses, actually separate from Youth with a Mission at the time. Dilaram was a Farsi word meaning peaceful heart. It was friendship evangelism centers set up in Kabul, Afghanistan, in New Delhi, in India, Kathmandu, in Nepal. And then we uh, find them coming back to Amsterdam at the start of the drug trail and eventually purchasing Haderbeck in 1975 as a discipling center, setting up the community training school in 1976. Let's just go through a few of these slides to remind us of the atmosphere of those days before I ask um, Joe and Trish Appler followed by Paul Miller and then Pierre LaBelle to share some of their memories. Quite a few of you will remember the Ark there behind the Central Railway Station. Several photos here lining it up opposite what was the Shell Building, very well-known landmark today. And here we, uh, we see an aerial shot showing uh, the... Um, the, this whole area of the Steiger 14 that's been completely transformed right now. But one thing I've discovered recently is that the one of the two paintings that Vincent van Gogh made here in Amsterdam was actually of this very same place. You can see the road going off to the left. I'll go back to this one here. You see the road or the, 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 the jetty, the Steiger next to the Ark, and there you see it again in front of those funnels. Um, and... Uh, so this was <laughs> Floyd Anno 73 after arriving in Amsterdam. And uh, some of you have many warm memories of that meeting room there. And some of you will be able to recognize yourself. We've got a circle around two hairy heads at the bottom there. Paul Miller on the left, Joe Appler on the right. And uh, Trish actually is right behind Joe. Um, and uh, I don't know that Mary's in the picture yet. Oh, yes, I think that's Mary also standing next to Trish. Maybe, maybe it's her sister. I'm not sure. Um, and there are other faces there you might recognize. I see Mike and Carol Sire and... Uh, here we see Mike and Carol Sire again in the living room, uh, the dining room. Um, and here John Goodfellow is about to lead an outreach, which I believe came from Amsterdam, uh, from Haderbeck. I think this might be 1978 or 79. Uh, I think that might be Ron Archer playing the guitar on the right. And uh, ready to head off downtown on outreach. The little Fiat car there on the, on the left, I recognize, is the Fiat that Ronke drove around in at the time when uh, we started courting. So, um, this was Amsterdam in those years, um, at the beginning of the drug trail out to the east. And we're going to start in the east here. Uh, well, no, I've got some more photos of uh, Haderbeek as it looked when, we f when Floyd and Sally first arrived and lived in the house there on the left. 
And here is a, the group in about September, October 1975. The leaves are on the ground. It's just after we've had a Dilaram conference there. And uh, Pete Fitzgerald is in the uh, middle there. Um, uh, Joe and Trish Appler on the right there. Barry Manson on the right. Uh, uh, sorry, there on the left. Barry Manson there on the right. Lura Garrido on the right on the right there. And uh, I had just arrived a few weeks myself there. I'm kneeling there on the right as well. We could spend a lot of time looking at all these different, trying to guess these names, but I want to get on to allow different ones to share their stories. And there's, of course, uh, Misha, just as a young girl, as she was at Haderbeck. And I also want to read this quote from Dave Andrews that appeared on Facebook recently. Uh, many of you know Dave, uh, Dave Andrews, former leader of the Dilaram House in New Delhi, and he wrote that some of you may know that Floyd and I didn't always see eye to eye, but at this time of his passing, I want to honor him for his enormous, generous contribution to our lives, which I acknowledge happily in my latest book, To Right Every Wrong. Thanks, Floyd. Yeah, there were a few bumps in the road here and there. and. Uh, but when we stop to reflect, we realize uh, what David is saying here, uh, honoring Floyd for his enormous, generous contribution to our lives. I wish I could give you a copy, uh, a, a, a photo of the page of just off Chicken Street, uh, but I can't even find anything online. I could, I've been going through the library here uh, at the port, and I don't know if anybody still has a rare copy of Just Off Chicken Street, but this was the book that told the story of this whole period. So, we're going to uh, ask for Joe and Trish Appler, Paul and uh, Mary, maybe it's just wh one of you, I'm not sure, uh, going to be sharing, and lastly, uh, Pierre LaBelle. So, Joe, um, I hope you're able to join us here. Let's see, is this, yes, wonderful. Wonderful yeah, to see you. Great to see you too. Great to see everybody else. I see the pictures and names from, wow. <laughs> <laughs> really takes us back. Your hair's changed color like mine. <laughs> yes. than I am still. <laughs> well, you know, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Once a hippie, always. <laughs> when you look back, you go right back to Kabul, don't you? Yes, Tell yes. All right, if you'll forgive me for reading this. I, I wanted to keep it concise. But Floyd was my first mentor in following Jesus. I had been a student at Christ for the Nations Institute, and I had a lot of teachers, but no mentors there. And I met Floyd at a YWAM Easter crusade in San Diego in 1972, while he was traveling the U.S. recruiting people for that infamous summer of 1972. Uh, he came and spoke at our Easter crusade, and the hook was in the jaw. And... Um, I knew that, that my first summer of service in YWAM, because I was enrolling in a school of evangelism at the time, and I knew that my first summer of service would be in, in Kabul. And then I would go on back to Germany to the Munich Olympics. So two weeks after I graduated from Christ for the Nations, and as a 21 year old, I ended up in Kabul, Afghanistan. And I was assigned to work in the uh, discipleship house, which was in, I believe, Kartichar was the area of Kabul that it was in. Um, I was barely over a year old in the Lord myself, and it was really an adventure. Um, it would take hours, of course, to talk about all the different things we learned and experienced, but I picked out a couple. Um, I remember we had a water baptism service in, I think it was, yeah, there's a picture right there. Uh, we were told by people that lived there, by the missionaries, that that was the first outdoor water baptism service in a thousand years in Afghanistan. And as we began, it was the cloud covered. And as soon as we started, believe it or not, there was a break in the clouds and a, a ray of sunlight shone down right on where we were gathered. And it was uh, just an amazing, amazing time. Uh, another thing I remember in that summer, and those of you who were there will also remember it, is when God spoke to the leaders and said, there's sin in the camp. And Floyd called for three days of fasting and prayer and uh, humbling and repentance. And at the end of that time, a few of the few people were sent home, but most people had great breakthroughs. And it was, it was a very powerful time. Um, my plans changed and I didn't go back to Germany for the Olympics. I stayed in Kabul 
And I think it was in November, Floyd asked me to lead a, a group of YWAMers going back to school and also some young believers, take them overland back to, to Germany. And so we did that, which was an amazing trip. For my first time, I'm glad that others I was with had been on that trip before. Is this 72 um, or 73? That was in, that was after the summer of 73. So it was in November or so of 72. And then I went to school evangelism in Switzerland. I met this wonderful lady and we got married and <clears throat> went on the field trip again. But then fast forward to the uh, summer of 1974 when Trish and I came to the Ark. Um, we were there for five months and you all know all the stories. We experienced them all together. But then we, uh, Floyd sent us with a small team to New Delhi. Uh, at that time, I knew I was called to, to Dilaram House in YWAM. I mean, as a YWAMer, I was called to Dilaram House. And we were going to start a house in Istanbul, which was kind of the gateway to the east. So Floyd sent us out to India to work with them there, with Dave, and then Paul Felitas led the house there for a while. And we went up to Kathmandu to visit the house. Trisha got really sick. And she flew back to, to Holland. And then I went overland again and met her in, at Heidebeck. That's right after we had moved into Heidebeck. It was the fall, I guess, of 75. Um, that was around the time when Lorem came and visited and he spoke and he talked about his desire to see a Dilaram house set up in Hawaii. And unbeknownst to Trish, to either one of us, God began speaking to both of us at the same time. And once we got our heads together and hearts together on it, uh, we both felt like the Lord was saying, it's not Istanbul, it's Hawaii. Tough call. <laughs> so we left, we were sent out, and we established a Dilaram house on Maui. We were there for three years. At the end of that time, we felt we needed a break. And Floyd, you know, we, we took a break. We were on, in California with Trisha's parents. And at the end of the three months, just didn't feel like we were ready to go back. And Floyd was passing through. And he uh, stopped. We visited with him. And he said, if you don't feel like you're ready to go back, don't go back. <laughs> and it was, that, that just was another example of the, the love and compassion that he showed for us. So that three months became pretty much four years. And after that, we came back to YWAM in Los Angeles, and we took over a ministry in Hollywood that had three house ministries, working with runaways, street kids, prostitutes. And in the seven years we were there, they were Dillaram houses and everything except name because that's the impact that Floyd had on us. And uh, we'll cherish it to this day. From Kabul to Hollywood, <laughs> um, quite an adventure. And yeah. we could spend the whole night uh, just talking about all these amazing things that took place. But it was Floyd who was the one who uh, set you on that, on that amazing journey. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And I think the same could be said for, for Paul and for Mary Miller. Uh, Paul, I wonder if uh, you're able to um, put your hand up right now. <laughs> See, I hope you're with us. So, uh, Joe and Trish are in Chicago, is that right? You're in Chicago? No, California, Los Pasadena, Los Angeles. Yeah. Oh, Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I think Paul's also in California somewhere. And, yes. Uh, here we are, Paul. <laughs> wonderful. And is this Mary in the background? I can't see very well. <laughs> Yeah, okay, great, Paul. Um, your hair's a bit shorter than when I last saw you. Uh, <laughs> but less too. Uh, yeah, so where did, where did your adventure begin with Floyd? I had met Floyd because uh, I had just recently been converted in uh, 72 in uh, India. And I was on my way back, I thought, to Labrie. I just read a book by Franz Ruckmacher called uh, Modern Art and the Death of the Culture. And I was yeah, given the names yeah. along the way. And I'd just been a Christian maybe 10 days. And I came through Kabul. I, got, I drank some of the water because it was cold after hot water. Six months in India where it was only lukewarm. I went, wow, cold water. Of course, I got dysentery. And I wasn't feeling very well. And I met Christy Wilson. And Christy Wilson said, well, I must introduce you to Floyd McClung. So we went over uh, to Floyd's. And Floyd said, well, you know, stay for dinner. So I stayed for dinner. I had my first uh, hamburger. I was a vegetarian. My first hamburger in two years. And uh, he said, well, you, you can go to Labrie, but if you want, you can stay here with us because that's what we're here for. And uh, that was the beginning of my 18, 17 years in uh, Youth of the Mission. It started with dinner 
and a hamburger is a good trick and I advise it. But uh, Floyd invited us in. And so I was there with him for, I don't know, a year and a quarter. And during that time, we noticed that so many people uh, were coming th uh, from Amsterdam, from the Magic Bus. I guess you could say Fondel Park in some ways was the Haight-Ashbury of Europe at the time. Uh, and my own sister, in fact, was in Haight-Ashbury earlier. But uh, so we noticed so many people were starting out from Amsterdam. So we said, what's this Amsterdam thing? And so, in fact, that summer of 72, I, I went, uh, my mother was living in Paris. I went to visit her, but I stopped in Amsterdam for a month. I stayed at the Ebenezer Youth Hostel, which I don't know if it's still there. I know the yes, shelter is still there. there. It's been closed by, with Corona, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. But uh, so I worked there for a month and, and I was assigned to kind of uh, scout out Amsterdam. Uh, because we were interested in, in Holland. We had heard about what was going on there. So I came back, I remember, and saying to the group, uh, I think it was September 72, and I said to the group, it, it's true. You know, there's su it's such a, a, uh, a launching place for all this movement with the magic bus, et cetera. Uh, but I tell you what, the challenges are, are, are huge. The housing situation, how you can find housing for a community of 45 people, I don't have the answer. Anyway, we used to, as a small leaders group at the house there, uh, pray about uh, this in, in Afghanistan. And I remember one day a message came through in the, mid, in the middle of our prayer. I remember uh, Floyd opening a letter from Don Stevens saying, listen, we've just had, and Ronke will remember all this, uh, we've just had a wonderful summer of service here uh, using two houseboats in Amsterdam. And uh, I, Don said, personally, I would really like to stay, but I really feel... God has told me I have other things to do. And I have felt that I should be offering, Floyd wasn't in youth of the mission at the time. Uh, he, Don said, you know, we would like it as why well, but I really feel I should offer these boats to you, this opportunity. And of course we have been praying about this for months. So we snapped that up. And um, as we began to pray, I was off trying to get my visa and, and Pakistan. When I came back, there had been a coup, the Russian tanks were on the streets. We were planning to leave anyway, but now the writing was really on the wall. It was time to leave Kabul. So this was 73. So the end of uh, the summer of 73, Floyd packed up this bus that he and Sally and maybe one other went overland on. And uh, I went with two or three other people overland through, through uh, Iran and then Turkey up through um, Germany, and then we came to Holland. And then the Dutch Christians welcomed us at this strange boat called the, uh, and it was a new adventure now. What, what's gonna happen here? And I remember one of the things that uh, the Dutch welcomed us with was something that was strange to any of us who were non-Europeans was something, I remember masses of blood sausage. And we all looked at these masses of blood sausage that was, uh, we, we, Floyd, we, we smiled and said thank you and cooked it up and it took us a while to get used to it, but it was better than just rice. So we ate that. Though I do remember Peter Grushka saying, good, good biblical uh, uh, proponent that he was, he stood on Acts 15 and said, it says there we should not eat blood, so I'm not having any of this. But the rest of us anyway, we ate it. And then began our adventure with the Dutch Christians. I remember uh, Dr. Chekstra was part of that crew. Uh, and the first months, in fact, I remember struggling with, we're not seeing breakthroughs in evangelism. We're not seeing conversions. I wonder what's gonna happen. But after a few months, people started responding to the Lord. Uh, we had a group uh, called, uh, I forget, uh, Chuck, Chuck Fields from California came over. They're playing a, an electric fiddle. We had a coffee bar there. Um, I remember John Goodfellow coming through with uh, three other uh, English. One was called Blue. You know, they're on their way to Iran for a spiritual uh, adventure, having financed themselves with a uh, insurance fraud. And uh, so they got stuck in Amsterdam trying to deal with this. And I remember John uh, right uh, coming through. And I remember thinking about this guy, John Phil Goodfellow, looking at him, thinking, this guy will never come to the Lord. Well, of course, things turned out somewhat different than that. And I also remember him, Mike Sia, who was another very important influence on the ARC at that time, who'd come through as a great teacher. Um, and he was quite a brain, Mike was. And John Goodfellow is a lovely man, but he, he was not quite on the same level as Mike Sia when it came to brain food. But he went in one night and talked apologetics to Mike Sia, and he came out wide-eyed, somewhat dazed, I think. Uh, but quite impressed with Mike. And I said, so what do you think about that? And he said, well, 
I didn't understand a word he said, but he certainly seemed to understand what he was saying. It seemed convincing, you know? So anyway, things went on. And Floyd was, I have to say, for me, was a huge influence in my life. He was the type of guy where I remember going down to Lausanne and seeing actually Riona uh, Jolly and uh, Joy Doss who were teaching on prayer. And we were down there and I was in a prayer group and this uh, German chappy who was uh, working in Britain, uh, we were in a prayer group after this. And he said to me, are you with Floyd McClung? And I said, yes, I am, why? He said, because you pray like him. And I think the wonderful thing about Floyd is thank God he rubbed off on people and he rubbed off on me. And I'm very, very grateful for the many, uh, and Mary would like to say it's okay. one thing too. Just one thing, um, you know, back then, women worked so much in leadership. Can you come closer to the microphone? When I first, when I first joined, when I first became part of the Dilaram um, ministry, it was right when they just came from Afghanistan onto the ark. And so we had these huge troughs that used to feed cattle because they were cattle, you know, the ark was used, I think, for animals or something. Actually, it was an orphanage and they had just- but whatever. <laughs> and they had a huge trough. <laughs> it was freezing cold, that cement floor. Anyway, I, I had been in leadership in my university. And when I came onto the ark as Christian ministry, Floyd recognized me as a leader and as a woman. And so we used to get together and pray about vision for the ark. And our, we'd go on prayer walks through the city as well. He'd help me bring food back because I was in charge of the kitchen. And I remember very clearly once, you remember the Children of God building? It became Samaritan's Inn. We yes. just stood there and looked at this building and the Children of God were a cult at the time and they were, you know, or the Moonies, some, some it group. Children of God. It was Children of God, yeah. And what happened was we just stood there and all of a sudden we just froze and we both threw our hands up in the air. We probably looked crazy, but you know, it's probably true. We are crazy. We were crazy. And we just began to claim that building for the Lord. And we just stood there for the longest time. And then we felt a release and we left. So it was the beginning of what God had for, for um, Floyd. And I, I would say that one of the things that I really took away with in my life is an appreciation for a man who is willing to stand up and say, okay, you're a leader, you're a woman. And I'm a he was right there with that all the time, which is fantastic. And I must just show well, this. I've never, yeah. This was made by, we got into this art, artistic uh, community on the ark. And this was the uh, genie and David were part of the Ark at the time. They made this for our marriage when we got married in Amsterdam. I won't go into the story of Floyd's part in it. But the other intriguing part about this is that when we renovated the Ark, they put new walls in uh, and the Dutch building community got behind us. And this is the wall from the Ark, <laughs> one of the new walls. <laughs> and of course we used all sorts of it for all sorts of purposes, but there it's part of the Ark right there. <laughs> well, thank you, Mary, for that story about the Samaritan's Inn building. I actually can remember 1974 also seeing that building being used by the children of God as a proselytizing brothel. I'd never heard that story about you and Floyd praying for the building. Romke and I live on the first floor of that building <laughs> now. We have been for the last three okay. and a half years. So thank nice. you for your investment in that sense. And I'd love to draw out so many more stories because you haven't even talked about Floyd sending you off to London uh, to start a Dilaram house there. Um, and uh, we could talk for a long time, but we're going to have to keep things tight to keep on moving. Otherwise, we'll never get to Absolutely. 1991. Thank you so much for connecting with us. And well, you good. also went out to Haderbeek right at the beginning where before oh, yeah. as, as things were being uh, negotiated, etc. cetera. And, uh, Could um, I just tell that little story with Don? Very briefly, yeah. Very briefly. We went out, uh, we heard about this uh, farm that was being used. Uh, it, was be, it was a bit too much for the Dutch couple that had taken on with great vision. And they had contacted Don and they said, we'd like to give this to somebody in Youth of the Mission. So we went that out there. That was Hank and Anne's Foss, yeah. Okay, hung, okay, excellent. And when, uh, the, part, the little part I want to show you, share is that Floyd was not perfect either, is that as we got there, Don was talking to this man and then he looked at Floyd as if to say, okay, it's now your turn to get in this conversation because you're the one that's going to be taking it on. And Floyd was kind of sharing and Don was looking at him going under his breath saying, say something, say something, you know. <laughs> so he wanted, so it started with human weakness and uh, we went on from there. 
Well, it's hard to, hard for us to, to to think of Floyd not being able to spout out some immediate <laughs> vision. <Exactly. laughs> That's a rare moment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul and Mary. Uh, you've got so much more to, to share as well. But let's move on to the stage when we're out at Haderbeke. And um, I remember first arriving there, September 75, uh, and it really was, you know, a, a hippie community. Uh, mm -hmm. The only person who didn't look like a hippie was this Dutch girl <coughs> named Ronnie de Graaf. And um, actually, you guys got married on the tree on the floor, uh, on the lawn outside uh, uh, the, the, the dining hall there. And I was to follow uh, with Romke there as well. But um, I'm going to ask Pierre Labelle to say something. Um, Pierre is in Montreal, and he came with his wife to the first community training school, and the last community training school we had there. I uh, was part of the Dilaram ministry. So, Pierre, it's, it's great to see you connecting from Montreal. Uh, give us some reflections on your time at Haderbeke. Well, uh, listen, I'm going to go back a little bit further than that in time, just to say that I, I'd like to mention here right now that we are celebrating today in honor of Floyd, the 50th anniversary of the birth of Dilaram in Kabul in, 19, in 1971. We're 2021. This is the 50th anniversary of Dilaram. There you go. And my first initial connection with Dilaram was here in Quebec in the Laurentian Mountains. The summer I came to faith in the summer of 73. And shortly in the weeks, uh, actually in the weeks, days following, I met a guy called Arthur Winnikoff, whom Floyd mentions in Just Off Chicken Street. Uh, Flo uh, Arthur had returned, had come to faith in 71 in Kabul, 71-72. He was a Jewish cocaine addict from Montreal before leaving Montreal. He came back to Montreal and to Quebec as a Christian uh, from Dilaram. So this was the first time I heard about Dilaram was in 73. Shortly after, I met another Montreal artist, Peter Aitkins, who became a Christian at Dilaram in southern Spain. And so I was familiar with Dilaram from the very summer I became a Christian. In 75, Floyd's book came out. And as I read it, I heard about Heidebeck, and I heard about the, the possibility of a community training program taking place in Heidebeck. Uh, I was shortly married. Uh, uh, I had actually, as a single person, applied to come to uh, Heidebeck for the community training program and to join Dilaram. Uh, between that time, I also started a special relationship, was engaged to be married within three days uh, of, of our relationship between the moment my wife and I talked about a relationship and were engaged. It was a three-day thing. Uh, two months later, we were married, ready to go off to Holland. And so we went, we went to Holland in, 70, in the spring of 76 for the second, actually this was the second community training program. And if I understand correctly, there was even a third one in early 77. Uh, so we did the second one. And what was particularly uh, particular for me about that summer of, of uh, the community training program at Heidebeck, uh, living there with Floyd and Sally and so many people, uh, was I have I, I still have remember I still remember that I had the sensation throughout the four months that I was there that I was simply floating in in, in air I, I was floating and carried and something transformative was happening in my life and, and my feet were not on the ground it, it was something beyond my capacity to control and I was being changed it, it was it was a significant magnificent. Uh, mo moment, and I think I think Floyd's stature, physical and spiritual, was certainly was was a part of that. Uh, I want to come to September to the end of that school. Floyd, uh, at the end of that community training program, Floyd mentioned different possibilities for ministry for the several students of us that were there, and in in that sharing, he mentioned the possibility of a Dillroom house in Paris. France, and he talked about Robert and Stella Co, uh, who would be leading that team. Um, and my wife and I looked at each other, and we knew that that was us. And so we went off. Uh, we were planning then. We planned to go off to Lausanne to do the the French School of Evangelism. That was the only French-speaking training program anywhere in the world at that time. And so as we planned that, we remained in Heidebeck, and maybe two things happened. Uh, in September of 76, uh, Floyd and other Dillerum leaders went off to Wisconsin 
for an international YWAM leadership conference. When they came back, Floyd shared for the first time that Dilaram had made a commitment to the cities of the world. Uh, so that was the beginning, the, the initial announcement of urban ministries in YWAM already in September 76, which confirmed to us our calling to Paris. So we remained in Heidebeek till uh, near the end of September. We left Heidebeek the day following Jeff and Ramkia's wedding. Uh, so we had the honor of celebrating your wedding, which Floyd officiated, and at the end of which he introduced, and here we have, I present to you, Mr. and Mrs. de Graff who are now Mr. and Mrs. Fountain, but at that moment, they were Mr. and Mrs. DeGraff. So that was, uh, that was also a little bit of a blooper that we can, uh, that we can remember. Um, so we went off to did the school event, uh, the school of evangelism, Robert and Stella, who were the, lead, the leaders for, Paris, for the uh, preparing to go into Paris, were our small group leaders, which was actually quite fantastic. Um, and so we joined them and others to launch and pioneer YWAM France for three years. We never made it, we never made it to Paris. The team started there in 81, uh, but we were called back to Quebec where uh, I helped uh, René, where we joined René Laframboise, who himself came to faith on the Ark in 74. So Dylan Ram was all around me here in Quebec. Um, and so René, uh, we worked with him for several years in Dunham, Quebec, which hosted the 76 Olympics. Um, but that first summer in, in Quebec, we led the school, uh, the, the summer of service in Montreal. And we knew that summer that Montreal was to be our destination. So again, the notion of cities, the, you know, so what I'm sharing here is that the legacy of Floyd, uh, you know, is continuing even today. Um, and out of that, uh, in Montreal, worked with with uh, Madeleine de Lille Madou, who came to faith in Delhi with Dilaram, uh, who became a Catholic nun, working in a university ministry uh, as a Catholic nun, and we collaborated with her for several years. Uh, so some of you may remember her. Um, but out of that, out of that, with uh, in in 1996, we hosted in Montreal the second North American Cities Conference. And at which time with Nick Savoca, John Dawson, John Peterson, and several other North American city leaders, we created uh, the North, what, what is now called the North American Cities Network. And we established the initial leadership team that today continue as the North American uh, Cities Servants Circle, of 12 of us representing just as many cities from Mexico to Vancouver, uh, from San Francisco to, uh, to uh, uh, New Orleans and, uh, uh, you know, and, and Detroit and Chicago. Uh, and, and this, I just wanted to say that this is the continuity and the legacy of Floyd 50 years later, pursuing with wonderful strength and vision uh, for, for cities, at least in our continents. Um, so, so thank you very much to Floyd for all and of that. Thank you, Pierre, for sharing that rich testimony of a very rich legacy. And uh, I didn't know you were going to say that, uh, that you remembered that incident from our wedding. I had the slide prepared to show later, so thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> but you now introduce us to this next phase, which really is focused on Haderbeek, um, from 1977 on to 1980, Floyd is there. Uh, we, we actually, uh, although Dilaram was merging in with, um, with YWAM, uh, it wasn't a smooth merger. We, we, it was quite a, uh, an eruption, actually. Um, and then we began, instead of having community training uh, schools, we started with the first DTS. And uh, we, um, uh, some of you will recognize the old family room here. Um, the, the Sarah where we would hold our um, love feasts in here, um, and that's Vilbert translating with Floyd. We're going to hear from Vilbert shortly. Um, and here is a Thanksgiving dinner that we had out on the grass there um, as a Thanksgiving for the harvest. And right behind, you see the garden that we had there. Um, and uh, this whole place has been so transformed, you wouldn't recognize it anymore, except that the trees are still there. Those are the trees where Paul and Mary got married, 
uh, Jim and Debbie Miller got married. Uh, uh, well, sorry, J Jim and Debbie Mellis and uh, Mike and uh, Debbie Miller and uh, Rumpkin and myself were married there as well. And uh, yeah, so here are some cute photos that my sons would um, find hilarious. Um, and yeah, here's this event and the love feast where we would sit on the floor carrying on the Eastern traditions. Um, and uh, this was the very first Dutch speaking DTS at Wilbert van Laken, who's there in the middle, third from the left, uh, was leading. And Bart Marianne Dornveer, Bart passed away sadly um, just last summer, standing up there on the right, I think at that stage with his fiance, um, Marianne. Um, here, the uh, the, 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 f the family room, as uh, many would remember it from those days. And uh, here, a, a, a shot of the, um, I think this would, would be, a, this even could be after Floyd had gone into Amsterdam, might have been a combined time, because I see John Peterson there, and I don't think he arrived until after Floyd had moved into Amsterdam, um, but you can see Floyd and Sally there circled on the right. Um, yeah, and here again, this seemed to be the place where Floyd and Sally would stand in these photos on the right there. Uh, and I couldn't see Floyd and Sally in this photo, but I could see Matthew there with the dog named Pooh. I remember he got the name because he, he pooed all over the place as Floyd brought him home. Um, and uh, yeah, many lovely uh, memories as you look through those photos. And this was the time where uh, Floyd popularized the message of the Father Heart of God. Um, uh, Robert, do you remember his name? Robert Frost was a pastor that Floyd had invited to Haderbeck, sharing about the Father's heart, and, and Floyd picked up that message and very much popularized it. Um, so this brings us through to uh, our Haderbeck time, as we've now uh, really embraced YWAM, uh, and YWAM has embraced Dilaram, uh, Jim Mellis, um, will share along with Wilbur van Laker and Tom Bloomer, so let's see, uh, Jim, are you able to, uh, uh, yes, here's Jim and Debbie. Uh, Jim and uh, Jim was a, a roommate of mine when I first got there. He and I shared a three-by-three three room with uh, four other guys. Um, and then I thought Jim came up with a brilliant idea how to escape from that to get married. So uh, he went first and I followed soon after. Uh, Jim, what is your takeaway from your times at Haderbeck? Well, <clears throat> I just thought I'd share a few things about the transition since that's the between Dilaram and YWAM, since that was uh, a key thing uh, or a key, key aspect of the, the, the period that you have under focus there. I'd actually joined the Dilaram ministry on the Ark at the end of 1974, and Debbie had come there a couple of months earlier than that. But I, I joined with almost no prior exposure to YWAM. And so, and I wasn't the only one. So, because Floyd at that time already, uh, maybe in 74, but at least in 1975, was already considering bringing Dilaram houses back under the umbrella of YWAM. He asked me and some of the others, uh, like Mike and Carol Saya, Paula Elrod, there was, I, I don't remember all the names, if we would uh, go down to uh, Lausanne for a three week leadership training seminar with Joy Dawson, Winky Prattney, and Campbell McAlpine. Uh, so that was probably my first real introduction to YWAM. Um, and then just over a year later, about a year after Debbie and I were married, we were actually the ones that were the first wedding at Heidebeck in October 75. Paul and Mary Miller got married in Amsterdam, as did Paul and Mary Felitas. We were three couples that got married in sequence, Paul and Mary Miller first, then us, then Paul and Mary Felitas. And Lura Garrido's first job on the base was to make three wedding dresses. So uh, that's a little piece of that uh, time, but that was in 1975. But because Floyd was already thinking about this change, he also asked Debbie and I, along with some of these other Dilaram leaders, um, to join the uh, International YWAM Leaders Conference in Eagle River, Wisconsin. I think that was when you and Ramke, Jeff, were just kind of in the last phases of preparing for your wedding. <laughs> um, and um, so, and then we had a Dilaram um, conference section within that larger conference. Uh, 
What I didn't realize at the time was that Floyd was personally investing in me as well as in some of the others who had also little exposure to YOM to help us make the transition uh, that became official in 1977. And that was the time at which Debbie and I were in APA leading a small discipleship community in an apartment there, which for decades afterwards became known as the APA house because we could never come up with a spiritual name for it. And we've only just given that up. Yeah, uh. that's right. <laughs> But that year, 1997, when a few of my fellow Dilram leaders raised objections to this transition, I too shared some of their concerns. But when I prayed about the change, I felt a peace about it. However, after some months of disagreement between Floyd and several of the other Dilram leaders, Floyd actually felt led to ask one of the leaders to leave. That's when I lost my peace. <laughs> and uh, privately, I met with Floyd and delivered a very heavy condemnation of his actions as a word of the Lord. I was trying to learn prophecy at that time, uh, not very successfully. Uh, but Floyd then demonstrated two of his excellent leadership qualities. One was being a good listener, and the other was humility and promising to pray over my word. When we met again, he said he did not receive confirmation regarding the content of my word, but he'd gone further to ask the Lord for insight into the emotions he had heard in my voice. Anybody who knows about active listening knows that listening to emotions is an important part of listening. He then passed on to me what he had received and asked me to pray about that. When I did, I sensed the Lord clearly speaking to me through both what he said and the way he said it. I also remember weeping later that year when I heard him share. Debbie and I wept together when he shared how he had become reconciled with that Dilaram leader who had been asked to leave. Another legacy that I've received from Floyd. During that transition from Dilaram to Wyoming, the Lord did other things in my life to help me grow. But I mentioned this incident because it was part of an ongoing pattern that I see in retrospect of Floyd investing in my and our growth in ministry as a mentor. When Debbie and I shared with him and Sally after leading that first, one of the first outreach teams out of that first Dutch DTS in 1977, when I, we shared about our calling to the Muslim world and our leading to go to North America for a year, uh, Floyd gratefully affirmed our plan to return to Ida Bake. And when we returned in 1979, there was a need again in the accounting department where I had set up the books and had worked for my first three and a half years in Dilaram and YWAM there. But he waved off my willingness to return to that job saying, Jim, that would be a step backwards for you. I need you to use your sociology background to help me with the urban research project that I'm initiating. Then some, some months, months later in 1980, he asked Debbie and I to pray about joining him in Amsterdam as support leaders for him and Sally in pioneering the Urban Mission Project. In return, he continued to invest in us through the ministry opportunities and support he gave us, especially through some difficult times over the next three years. And all this I share because it was an example of his, to me, of leadership and mentoring that had a profound effect on our lives and our ministry over the past three decades, three and a half Thank decades. Thank you, Jim. Since. That leads us now, very good bridge, as we begin to prepare to move into the Amsterdam phase. Um, thanks for sharing <coughs> all of that. It's, it's, it's frustrating for everybody because there's so many stories to tell, and we're just trying to uh, uh, keep this in a fairly short period of time. Now, Wilbert, uh, are you there down there in the Swiss Alps somewhere? Um, <laughs> it's great to see you both Wilbert and Judith, um, and you led the first DTS in Dutch, the Dutch-speaking DTS, and vowed never to do it again, and you've never done it again. <laughs> Tell That's us. Right. Uh, can you what, hear me? What, yes, we can hear you well. Go ahead. Yes, we are here in the Swiss Alps, not quite in the Alps, but we are. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, yes, we started that first Dutch DTS. Uh, 1977, when Judith and I came uh, back from Switzerland to join the work in Holland. Um, in fact, I came, we didn't come to the Dillon work, we actually came to YWAM and Romke and I 
especially in those early days, we would we were YWAM Holland, um, Ronnie and I, and uh, we would travel through the country. We would uh, sell books uh, so that we would have a little bit of money in our pockets so we could buy gasoline to travel back to Amsterdam. Um, we were very poor and uh, YWAM Holland didn't have that money, that much money. Um, and we were a separate unit for quite a while. At least that's the way it came across to me. Um, of course, things improved a lot later on, but we started, Floyd encouraged us very much to start the uh, first Dutch DTS. We have a picture here. Um, of course, we have uh, Marius, some of us remember, uh, 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 Hans van Ede van der Pals, but we see under uh, uh, Letitia there. And Letitia was a nun. She had been in a convent for what was the lady it? Lady on the bottom years? left. Yes. Bottom left. For the years she came out, and this is an example of 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 who Floyd was. In his generosity, Letitia was able to join us at Heidebeek and become a part of the ministry, and she found a home with us. Um, of course, things weren't always that easy, not for Floyd and Sally either, because when Judith and I came, uh, we lived in the last bar bar in the barracks there, in the last uh, unit. And one of the first things we did is we bought a stove and a fridge. And Floyd and Sally were tremendously encouraged by it because they came from Dillerham. And all these people from Dillerham, they had, I think it was almost forbidden to have personal luxury goods. It was community. And Floyd and Sally said, thank you that you are buying a fridge and a stove for yourselves because now we feel much freer to do it for ourselves as well. Um, of course, in those years, uh, so much was happening at Heidebeek. Uh, Heidebeek was bought, then the Herdershof in 1977 uh, from Sister Louisa. Uh, Judith About and I moved down there, the road. Yeah. just down the road. Uh, later on, of course, Seerenhof and Lichtenduster and so on. Um, but um, back to the uh, DTS, uh, one of our students was Marianne Doornweert. And Bart was on staff. And when we think of what Bart and Marianne have done over the past many years, I'm just absolutely humbled and amazed by uh, what people have accomplished and not just them but all most of us who are here in this meeting uh, tonight and i see that on the list there's, there's more than 200 almost 270 people here on the list we've all been Marianne on the top right on the top Marianne right. is on the top right yes yeah. and and we've all been so affected by floyd and his general Generosity and his leadership and his, his example. And that must have been part of what Bart and Marianne uh, have taken with them as they have had their ministry in India and Nepal and over there over the, over the past many years. And of course, yeah. Bart passed away last they ran year. They the Dilaram house in Kathmandu for a while. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Then um, because of Floyd's travels and speaking engagements, uh, the other schools we started, uh, DTS, so we had large schools. And we had more than, was it 60 plus people or even 90 people? I can't remember. Um, but there were so many people that we didn't know where to house them. So Jan Schuert, Pasterkamp, and a bunch of others, they were- 78 uh, would have been- in, What's that? Uh, in, they, um, we had seven, 78 people. That was the maximum Romke remembers that we could actually have at the time. Right. Yeah. And, but we had no housing. So a number of them were placed in, 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 at campsites in the surrounding forests. That's right. Um, and then, of course, with outreaches going to Spain and Malta and Ceuta and Venice and England and Athens and Russia and all over. And, and this all happened through the ministry at Heidebeek under Floyd's leadership. Actually, I can we see George a, Jr. a little bit. I, yes. I, 
in this photo here, I, I can see George Otis Jr.'s head, which made me realize, oh, this is 79, preparing for the Moscow Olympics of 1980. Yes. Indeed. And yes. they were living at the Korburg, one of the camping grounds in the neighborhood. That's right. I've forgotten about George Otis, but um, he is uh, another one uh, who profited from Floyd's leadership and, and generosity. He lived with us uh, in the community, and he, uh, he did a tremendous job in preparing for the Russia outreach and prepared a booklet. He had almost free reign at Open Doors, where he was able to copy uh, all, much content of, of, of go through their files. Um, another story of the many. One last well, of one. course, we had uh, weekly luffies, we had celebrations. One thing I remember, and that is that at Christmas one year, Floyd asked each of us to make a commitment for a whole year. The next year, we had to commit not to leave, but to be a part of the ministry. This has never happened to any of us, I think. Um, that was unheard of to, to have to commit yourself for a whole year. Um, that was Floyd as well. Then the Sunday night services at the Sierra Hof that started with uh, Dutch people driving up to an hour to be there every week uh, for the services. And I remember well a letter we got one day from a Dutch lady, and this letter was critical. She it was, it was harsh, it was difficult. And Floyd mentioned that to us in our leadership meeting, and Floyd said, we need to go before God and hear what he has to say to us through this. That was Floyd. Of course, he couldn't do this all by himself. I'm rushing through this, Jeff. I see your picture popping up here. Sally kept the flowers fresh at her window. Uh, John the Baptist, alias Ronnie de Graaf, registered Jeuk met een opdracht and bought the ark and kept on doing good works until to this very day. The Christian school was started by Nadine Heinen and Albert Hoekstra. Uh, Theo Arts started his bookshop ministry. Gary Tissing had his pigs and cows and bunches of vegetables. Arnie Wilkening kept the vehicles going. Bart Farweig drove the bus. Amy Harbring cooked beans and rice and cabbage for weeks. Do you still smell it? On an old stove until Bob Pierce from uh, World Vision gave us the money for a new stove. And a host of other saints, all of us who were there and who went through there and worked with Floyd, of most of whom have continued since in ministry, each in their own right, each well respected and full of faith and the Holy Spirit and wisdom, many of whom are here at this meeting. What a privilege. Let me almost, I'm almost finished. At our leadership meetings, there was vision, encouragement, time in the word, correction and prayer. And Floyd believed in prayer. When I rang the doorbell in early January, 1974 at the Ark and asked if I could join, I was kept waiting outside for about half an hour while Floyd and Sally prayed and asked God if I could do this. And this was, I believe today they use forms, but in those days they prayed. And Floyd, of course, was woken by Sally one night because Sally was sick and Sally said, Floyd, can you pray for me? And Floyd stretched out his hand and touched Sally and said, Lord bless Frodo. That was their dog at the time. Uh, so Floyd believed in prayer. He could also laugh. And uh, I think well, we can... Thank you, Phil. This, this, this has been very rich. And uh, we, we look back, that's 40 years since Floyd left Hayda Baker, continues to be a springboard for world missions. I wanted to, I mean, I, I remember going with you and Floyd, Don Stevens, Lynn Green, Mark, Mark Spengler, to Venice to look at the ship that was being sold for scrap metal called yes. the MV Victoria. And yes. that, that was the birth of the Mercy Ships. Another yes. whole story in itself. That's well, right. Well, we're going to have to wrap it up here. We've already, um, I didn't mention how long we were going to go today because I knew it was going to be very hard to keep to my, uh, yeah. my time framework. But we're going to have to move on and ask Tom Bloomer to, to come. So thank you, Bilbert. Thank you, Judith. 
um, for joining us tonight. And uh, Tom, um, Tom came to uh, be with us for a number of times. Tom uh, at Haderbeck with, with Cynthia. So you tell your story, Tom. Well, we were students in our school in Lausanne, and Floyd came as a speaker and invited us to the speaker's room after lunch one day, and it started out by saying, well, it's obvious the Lord is going to use you in leadership. And I was in shock because it wasn't obvious to me at all. <laughs> I was a brand new Christian and uh, had a huge inferiority complex with all these YWAMers around me talking about books of the Bible I'd not only not read, I'd not heard of. And I just thought, well, I'd like to join this group, but I'll certainly never be a leader. But Floyd, with his, his uh, talent spotting uh, apostolic anointing, saw that I had this kind of calling. So he invited us to Heidebeck, which we were, or not to Heidebeck at the time, to join him. And, and we were very excited about that. But then just a few weeks later, both Joe Portali and Lauren Cunningham recruited us to join the French ministries. Uh, out of Lausanne, and, but we felt so positive in prayer about Floyd's invitation, we didn't know how to put it together. Well, Floyd would come and speak very regularly in Lausanne, and one of the later times, he said, we are, we're going to become YWAM, and uh, join YWAM, and we want to develop our community training school into a DTS, could you come for a few months and help? So I, th I think that was in uh, January 1976. I couldn't have that wrong, but it seems to me that's what it was. So we went, we drove back from a missions conference in Lausanne with Floyd and spent, I think it was six months that first time in Heidebeck. And I was meeting with Floyd and this other leader whose name I forget, who left uh, after a couple of years. Good guy. He was very old, probably 35. And we'd meet a couple times a week and um, pray about this you know, the direction things were going. And it was really to also to, to manage the culture change in prayer. And they know in, 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 in the business world now, when you try to merge two companies, it's very difficult. And most of the time it doesn't work and it ends up losing a whole lot of money. They like to do mergers anyway, because the lawyers and accountants make money off the fees. But anyway, so we were helping him walk through that and I was teaching. And, and also at the time, Cynthia was working with Sally to start the first preschool at Heidebeck, which was really a, a leadership training school because one of the kids was named Misha, who had all the leadership strengths of her parents and uh, was very verbal about how she thought the preschool should be run. <laughs> but Cynthia was strong enough to handle Misha, which Sally appreciated. But we would come back for every school uh, three or four times a year. We'd come up from Lausanne to Heidebeck, either me or when Cynthia could get away, she'd lo love to go to, to Heidebeck too. But then the other thing that happened is that when, we, when I got back from Kona, helping Howard and Lauren start the university, there was no housing for us in Lausanne. So Floyd invited us to come to Amsterdam for a few months. And we were going to do the LTS in April of 88. So January through March, I, my job was, was working every day on the development of the university in Europe, in Europe and working very closely with Floyd on that. And he really had the vision. He already had the vision of teaching the nations because he had started with Jeff this magazine, Insight, um, that was the first YLAM publication trying to bring big bookal thinking into the current questions of the day. And I still don't think there are hardly any of those publications in Hawaii. It was very groundbreaking. And I remember the time, Jeff, you got a letter from the, the Archbishop of Canterbury thanking you for one of the articles in Insight. I hope you saved that letter. It would be worth a lot on eBay, as will your old copies of Insight, everybody. <laughs> but anyway, our advisory board decided that the direction that I had been working on with Floyd for the University of the Nations, it was not the way to go. And they shut that down. And that, that was one of the hardest experiences in my life. Um, and Floyd was led then to go off in another direction. And he got, as we all know, into church planning, which, which the Lord used him mightily in. 
and, and I'm not saying that that he made a mistake or that the Lord made a mistake. <laughs> I'm not that dumb. <clears throat> but um, I will say I have often wondered since then, what if Floyd's incredible leadership, gift, and teaching ministry had, had gone into the teaching of the nations and the University of the Na Nations as a structure to teach us how to teach the nations? I think the world would be a different place. But the world is a different place anyway because of all the, the church planners that Floyd inspired and trained. So I join you all in thanking the Lord for the gift that he was to all of us and to the body of Christ and to the whole world. Well, thank you, Tom. You've already moved us towards the transition into Amsterdam. So let's move into that third phase. Um, 1980, Floyd and Sally moved back into Amsterdam, lived in the cleft, um, and uh, eventually uh, with the purchase of the building behind us here, I'm sorry for the fuzzy photo, but um, this was the former Salvation Army headquarters, the building that Paul and Mary were talking about, uh, that Mary was saying she and Floyd stood in front of that building uh, when it was being used by the children of God. And um, this is when Floyd launched the vision for urban missions and also was appointed the Europe, Middle East, and Africa uh, leader. Uh, you may remember the Randers Conference in 1985. I think we had 5,000 5, people up there. Paravin Stieg uh, was um, helping to, to, to organize that up there under Floyd's leadership, who uh, pulled in very key um, speakers from around the world. And, um, uh, and then it was actually that same later that same year when uh, we had a big event in Hawaii when Lauren handed over the uh, directorship, the international directorship role uh, to Floyd, uh, a role that he carried until 1993. So um, let's just go through these uh, slides to remind us of the time where we would hold these large evangelistic events there on the Dumb, um, and Floyd, John Goodfellow, and others uh, would be preaching there. Uh, here's a, a, a photo of uh, the building when it was, the headquarters of the Salvation Army, and on the right now, this is how it, um, the building looks right now. We've just had it renovated. It's never looked so good, actually. Um, and then Deport, um, where we're uh, streaming from right now, uh, it's just so amazing to have these two major pieces of real estate in such key locations in Amsterdam. This is a major part of Floyd's legacy uh, for us. And it was about, uh, actually it was in the, still in the Haydavik stage uh, phase when Karen Lafferty um, made contact with Floyd and he invited her to come to Haydavik. Uh, she went through school there and uh, this is where she began to get her vision for musicians for missions, and she's going to tell us about that in a little bit. Um, the ministry of Dave Pierce, the rock priest, Steiger 14, which was the place where the, um, uh, where the ark used to be. All of that has been totally rebuilt behind the railway station. You'd hardly recognize it. The only Steiger that has a number on it still is Steiger 14, except it's a big L-shaped uh, Steiger in a slightly different... Uh, position. But this uh, Steiger Ministries is still one of the dynamic ministries that visits here, brings teams into Amsterdam. Uh, they have different centers around the world. One of them is close to Dresden uh, and uh, really two still on the, on the cutting edge of, uh, of evangelizing amongst young people. So uh, let's switch now to uh, just a short clip from an old video. I, um, Okay, I need to have this blanked out. So uh, let's see if we can. Um, yeah, here we are. I think we've got this coming up now. You can find this yourself online, Streets of Amsterdam. It's 21 minutes. We're just going to listen to four minutes of it. Streets of 
my name is Floyd McClung. I'm standing here in the red light district of Amsterdam, Holland. I'm standing actually in one of the main streets here in the red light district. We're right in the middle of a long rectangular neighborhood that's some 10 or 12 blo blocks long and about six blocks wide. It's about um, seven or 8,000 female prostitutes that work out of this neighborhood. They sit in the windows uh, that you can see behind me. An average prostitute would make five, $600 a day. There's about four or 5,000 male homosexual prostitutes working out of this neighborhood. It's a very needy area of Amsterdam. Right to the next street over is the main drug area of Amsterdam and actually of Europe. There's some 10,000 hard drug addicts in this city. There's about $750,000 a week of heroin sold just in the little two block area right next to us. I've been living here in this city with my wife, Sally, and our two children, Misha and Matthew, for the last four years. And I'd like to share with you how God called me to this city, called my wife and called our children to be here. I'd like to share with you because I want to share the burden of my heart, the concern that God has put there for this city and for other cities around the world. Five years before we, were, we came into the city, we lived in a very beautiful area outside of Amsterdam. We lived in a beautiful dairy farming area with national forest all around us. And then God began to put a burden on our hearts that he wanted us to come into this city. My family and I actually live on the next street over. Um, we found when we moved into the neighborhood that two doors to the right was a Satanist church, four doors to the right was a homosexual brothel, and two doors to the left was a pornographic cinema. And as you can imagine, we were quite surprised when we found the environment that we were living in. So we had lots of practical questions to ask. I'm kind of the visionary family. In fact, um, and my wife is very practical, and I figure if I can get one of my big visions past my wife and her practical questions, it has to be from the Lord. But, of course, we did ask a lot of practical questions, very important questions about our family. What, where would our children go to school? What, what kind of children would they play with? Where would they play? And as we begin to consider those kinds of questions, as well as asking ourselves, what, what would our role be here in the city? Could God really use us to make an impact on a city that had so many needs? Then we begin to be convinced that, that uh, God did want us to be here. A growing conviction came in our hearts. And God really spoke to us that he wanted us to come with our family here. And I began to be aware that God was saying to me that the kind of inheritance that he wanted me to pass on to my children was not of earthly security, not of thinking in terms of the future or the neighborhood, but that he wanted me to pass on to my children an inheritance of compassion for needy people and a burden for the lost. Our children are involved in the outreaches with us. They witness to people. My little daughter has helped lead one of the prostitutes of the Lord that she walks by. She goes to school right here on the other side of the red light district. They're involved in intercession. They're normal children, but God's done something wonderful in their hearts for the Lord. And that's, that's a, a tremendous encouragement to Sally and myself to see our children really belong to what we're doing. Now, you can look for that video and see the whole video if you'd like, uh, but we're going to have to move on. Um, we, uh, um, we've now reached the, the, the streets of Amsterdam. Um, this is the, the, the phase at which, um, well, the story is told in Living on the Devil's Doorstep. And uh, uh, I'm going to ask Karen Lafferty and John and Mindy Peterson, Pauline Zeman lenz and uh, Sarah Lanier, uh, if they could each give two minutes uh, sharing about their time there in Amsterdam. So, uh, is this Karen? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Karen. Hi. Wonderful. You could uh, connect with us. Yeah, I'm glad I could be here. I just finished the YWAM conference in Mexico. And we're back in where are you right California now? for just a little time. But, where are uh, you right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Southern Cal at a nice place. Anyway. Southern Cal. But, okay. <laughs> But I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. But, you know, I first met Floyd when I was singing at his father's church uh, here in uh, Southern California when I was a contemporary Christian artist. And I, I was about to do one of my first tours to uh, uh, Europe. And he said, well, come visit us, you know, and, and I was quite keen to do that. And so as I was in Holland, I did uh, visit uh, uh, both the Ark and got to sing at the coffee house on the Ark and then went out to Heidebeck. And of course they placed me in the green guest room with uh, just off Chicken Street, right by my bedstand. And, you know, it was a real setup and God tricked me into being a missionary, which I've never regretted. But, you know, I am just, I see so many people here that, uh, and it's just such a privilege to have been 
part of Floyd's legacy because the Lord used him to launch not only Musicians for Missions and uh, the ministry that I ended up leading, but um, so many, many, I mean, I think of, you know, Steiger and Go Teams and many things. He was such an encourager of leaders, and I'm so grateful for that. But for me personally, it was also when I, um, when I was, you know, stumbling along my way and and, and I fell into some immorality and, and Floyd did not just send me home and send me out of there. I'm just so grateful for Floyd and YWAM for walking me through healing. And uh, that's, that's uh, for me personally, the biggest legacy that Floyd has in my life is, is just really believing that uh, the Lord could do healing and the Lord could um, really take me through all of this. So. So much more we could all say, but I'm so grateful to have uh, been part of, uh, you know, Amsterdam and, and building it at that time. Some really exciting stories. Some of them will be in my biography that's coming out, uh, hopefully this coming year. Thank you, Karen. You've got so much more to share. I have all the warm memories of uh, the Concerts for the King, you and I and, and Peter Helms fronted uh, yeah. through all the capitals of Holland as well and contribute to, contributed really to uh, the worship scene in this country. And I see John and Mindy there. Wonderful to see your faces. Let's hear your story. Thank you so much. Hey, it's so good to see all you guys. Wow. This is torture. I mean, to, to, to is. spend two minutes trying to get the life of this big, beautiful friend of ours in you on it. Tr and try chairing it. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you're doing a great job, my friend. Um, I remember we met him in 1978 at a pastor's conference, and he suggested that we become missionaries. The last thing I wanted to be, I grew up in the mission field. I had no desire to be a missionary. Three years later, we met Floyd and Kona when we had made the step to go to, to the base there to go to the first leadership training school. And he's walking on the beach when we're having a romantic evening. He broke the mood completely and invited us to Amsterdam as missionaries, which we accepted. And... Um, I remember walking with Floyd that first day that we arrived and saying to him, how do you keep your heart from getting calloused with all this stuff going on day and night? And he said, you keep your eyes on Jesus and you let him give you his love for the people and for the city. And I remember that was like a litany that began a stream of amazing lessons that I know a lot of us drew from, from Floyd and Sally. Um, when I think of Floyd, I think of the consummate liver of truth. He didn't just teach. He was a superb teacher, writer, but he was a liver of the truth. And he brought you along into that journey. And um, I remember being at Heidebeck and I was hurting. I'd come off of a, a pretty hard situation pastoring in the United States. I was really in pain. And I remember him being at Heidebeck, speaking on unity in the body of Christ, which I did not want to hear about at that moment. And he walks all the way back during the ministry time, crawls over 10 people, kneels in front of me. I mean, he was bowling people out of the way with his large frame. And he took my hands, looked in my eyes, and he said, I'm going to get inside of you. And he did. And the Lord did. And it was a beautiful thing just to journey with Floyd on this journey. Karen shared it so beautifully about helping us with our faults. Um, just a couple little quick things, and then I'll stop, of course. Um, I loved Floyd and Sally's relationship. I feel like their marriage was such a, a picture of how to bring a family into a place, how to love each other through amazing stuff. I know we talk about a lot of Floyd's exploits, but you know, one of his greatest accomplishments is the marriage that he and Sally had together. And, that, and the way they raised their kids in the Red Light District, we came in 81. Uh, we followed in their footsteps. We, we were friends till the end. And that was one of the main things is that friendship in, in marriage that they so modeled before us. Um, he was a fearless leader because of it. He led us into the red light district. We followed willingly. The, one of the other highlights of our time together was just the amazing team that God brought together. I, I, I am um, not only in Holland, but in Amsterdam and I live out of the legacy of a man that learned how to lead a team and pass on that. It ruined me. I, I can't do stuff alone anymore. I've got to have the right team. So just, I thank the Lord for Floyd's love for the Dutch, for Holland, for the Netherlands. I, I, I tell you, 
he say he used to say give me one really crusty dutchman let god wreck him with jesus and we'll change the world and that's all i remember floyd thank you thank you john and and, and mindy i would so much love to be, give you the chance to share as well you know what we're going to do when we finish this in just uh, in, in 10 or 15 minutes we're going to have the opportunity to break out into breakout groups according to these three phases the the Dil early Dilaram, the Haderbeck, and the Amsterdam. So you'd be able to continue to, to share if you're able to stay online. I see Sarah's there. Sarah Lanier, uh, mm. wonderful to see you. Um, can you give us a couple of minutes of your reflections? Yeah, I'm like, John, this is torture. <laughs> um, I, when I think of Floyd, I think of him as just pioneer in, in, in every direction. When I came in 1982, I feel like a, a you know a later a latecomer in this group. Um, I sat down with them and I said, I just have a question. He said, Sure. I said, Can I ask you questions? Uh, is, is there any question I can't ask without being called insubordinate or rebellious or or something like that? And he said, You can ask me anything as often as you want. I only ask that you ask it to me directly, and not behind my back. And uh, don't worry, I'm not scared of strong women. I married a strong woman. <laughs> and I didn't even think that was an issue. I didn't even think of it that way. It was just like, I had questions. And he welcomed them. And for years, I had an appointment every week with my list of questions and I'd go in there. He was extremely intentional on developing leaders. I didn't see myself as a leader. He told me I was, I argued with them and I lost the argument because he would just call leaders forth. But he was intentional in our development. Every other Tuesday night for a long time, he and John Peterson had leadership development evenings that everyone in leadership was required to come to and anyone interested could come. So people who weren't in leadership could come. And we would, we would have, he would have a stack of books someone gave him and hand them out, read the book, tell us what it is about because I can't read all these books. Or he'd bring in you know, Gordon McDonald and spend a week with us. And we, he would just keep investing, investing, investing. He taught me how to take risk. I, I heard later, uh, uh, from Ian Muir that uh, pioneers are risk takers. They're high on risk and low on caution. And, and that's how he was. And I'll just jump to the end of my two minutes to say that when I went to the hospital to see Floyd a year after he was uh, now in Cape Town and, and not able to communicate, um, as many of you who maybe have got the chance to go experience, he would just cry when he sees you. And I felt like the Lord told me right then, Floyd, you have been a pioneer for the world, in, it, not just in YWAM, other circles, other, you know, you have been the one who's shown the way because God has needed people who will plow the hard ground. And now, because of what you're going through, Sally is picking up the mantle and she's helping you pioneer how to suffer. And the church needs to know how to suffer, to address the cheap theology that's told us we can just pray it out and it'll be gone. It, it, you are, and it lasted five years, but we got discipled through Sally's journaling and chronicling, always giving God the glory, always pointing us back to his faithfulness. And I believe she was used by God to help Floyd disciple us again in pioneering a phase that the, the church needs to be ready for, and we are already facing in the persecuted church. So I, I just can't say enough about how Floyd as a critical thinker, uh, as an encourager, as a person who was about people and relationships, was a, a leader that was an absolute privilege to work with. And now I'm going, then how can I not keep giving to the next generation? And it's inspired me to start things. So yeah. I'm just going to say thank you to Floyd and Sally. Thank you, Sarah. That was very clear and very, uh, very encouraging. And um, I'm going to ask Pauline. Pauline, we knew her, her as Lens when she was in YWAM. Now Pauline Zayman Lens. And uh, here, speaking to us from Ada in, uh, in the Netherlands. Welcome, yes. Pauline. Lovely to see you. So good to be with you all. I wish I could visit with all of you. I hope in the breakout groups. 
So good to see John and Mindy and Karen and Sarah and all those people I know from Amsterdam, but also from Heidebeek. I came to know Floyd and Sally through the Heidebeek ministry. My father was a, a doctor and he introduced Floyd to the mayor in Heerde so that he could find a way to get his lodgings there at Heidebeek, get some favor with the mayor. And you so grew up very close to Heidebeek, didn't you? Yes, we lived right nearby. You lived there, yeah. And I had just become a Christian a, year, a few years before that, but I didn't think Wyvern was so kosher because it was interdenominational. That wasn't good in those days. But anyway, the Holy Spirit got me and I joined YWAM. I was in Asia for seven years in frontline evangelism. And uh, then I came back to uh, YWAM and, and joined YWAM Amsterdam because the Lord had opened the door for me to become a TV presenter with the evangelical broadcast. And I didn't think I could do that on my own. I thought I need the YWAM community. And Floyd and Sally have helped me with my TV presenting. They encouraged me, they prayed for me. But I was also part of the development department, which was doing fundraising, fundraising for the port, which we had just purchased. And it was a 3 million guilder building. And that was a lot of money for us. So I was um, assigned to uh, visit major donors and I'll show you a note that, that, that Floyd wrote to me. And he was so attentive, you know, so thoughtful, talking about developing leaders like Sarah said. He says, I feel the best use of your time is the development department, not secretarial or administrative. I would like you to encourage to focus your attention on visiting our partners, major donors, friends of YWAM, calling them on the phone, praying with them, doing Bible studies, etc. Do you agree that these areas are, are strengths for you? And then I thought, my goodness, what leader would ask me that question? So talking about a leader who is, you know, doing the talent spotting, but also asking, do you think that's a good idea? I mean, I have never ever had a, meeting, a leader like that before. He also pointed at me and said, I believe in women in leadership. And I go, what, me? You've heard Sarah say it and others. And it's been a major theme in my life, women in leadership. So I cannot thank Floyd and Sally enough. I, I went um, through the whole nation with Marita Schepers and Randy Powell, and we uh, uh, did major donor visits and we prayed for them and we held, held meetings for hundreds of donors of YWAM Amsterdam. And it was such a dynamic time. These last five years, we've been praying for Floyd and Sally, George and I, almost every day. And I hardly ever do that, but God put it on our hearts to pray for them every day. And we've been suffering with them and thinking, my gosh, how can this be, you know, this wonderful man of God. And then I was reminded that Corrie ten Boom suffered for five years, lying mm -hmm. on her bed, praying and interceding for the world as she was lying and she couldn't talk anymore. And I thought, oh, I hope it's not longer than five years. And I'm so glad now the Lord, the Lord has taken Floyd to himself because I found it very, very hard to pray for him, for him for so long, heaven or healing, and now he's with the Lord. So I think it's great comfort for the family and friends that he's now with Jesus. And now our prayer focus should be on Sally because she's really going through it now with her own health issues and stuff. So let's join together to intercede for Sally. And um, thank you so much for this wonderful meeting, Jeff, for putting this together. Thank you, Pauline. That's a very clear testimony. And that brings us to the end of the three phases we were looking at. But there's one more thing we're going to do. Uh, John mentioned that Lauren... Uh, that Floyd's heart was for the unity of the body of Christ. And it was with this in mind, it was actually started, uh, Lauren and uh, Joy uh, and, and Don had been holding some uh, leaders' conferences. Also, Brother Andrew had been involved. And they came and, uh, in 1979, and we, we had such in Haderbeek. Uh, Vilbert had mentioned um, Bob Pierce from World Vision, who came through Haderbeek at that time. And we were getting ready for this conference and he said to, uh, to Anka Tissing at the time, uh, girl, uh, go and get the biggest uh, uh, oven you can, you can find. You need to replace this wood-burning <laughs> old piece of junk and uh, have that in place for this leaders' conference. And um, this conference went on to, be, to spread to other places in the country. And at the peak was uh, drawing in 600 leaders from different parts of the body of Christ, as well as then spawning a, uh, a separate conference for more mainstream,
mainstream domines. And uh, this has had um, ongoing effect. And I'm going to ask Hank Dick and Kees Guttard to join us. I hope that they've been able to hang in there because we're half an hour behind our scheduled time. Uh, Hank and uh, Kees, are you with us? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay, let's, can we put their pictures up? Uh, uh, how do we, okay, okay, this is Kees, who has been really recognized in full gospel circles as a, has a long-term apostolic ministry, a heart for missions, uh, a link between local fellowships and, uh, uh, and, 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 and mission fields, as well as Hank Dick, who's been a, who's a veteran pastor uh, from Rosendahl in the south of Holland. And um, both of these men have been very uh, key uh, supporters involved with the Leaders' Conference. Uh, Case was on our leadership committee there. So, Hank, a few impressions for you. What was the significance of these leaders' conferences uh, for you and for, for Holland? And I'll ask the same question for Case. Well, there's a couple of things that were happening at the end of the 60s and the 70s. In the 60s, we were challenged in Holland by Operation Mobilization. That was a big movement. And then in the early 70s, we came across YWAM. We all had to learn how to pronounce the words YWAM because it was not not a common Dutch word. And uh, I think YWAM had made the, all the ministry, Floyd's ministry had been overwhelming. This morning, a, a visiting pastor shared that in all of his life, he's been mm -hmm. using the book, The Father Heart of God. He still uses it in counseling people. And for the Dutch leaders, Father Makers One has been the main theme also for the leaders' conferences. And uh, the leaders' conference brought something very special to Holland. For those that have been in Holland know that one Dutchman is very special, two Dutchmen is a church, and three Dutchmen is two churches. So the, the impact of the leaders' conferences for the leaders have been great. And um, Case has been more involved than I have, but I've been there also, and, and I know the impact of Floyd and all of you. Um, um, well, there was one leaders' conference, Jeff, that you may remember, that we took an offering for your trip. And you were leading the worship song, and when we finish the offering, you send the song, it is finished. That is for Brav. <laughs> it is for Brav. Nice I remember that was the next song on my list. That's yeah. right. It is finished. Yes. Well, anyway. The price um, is paid. A Graham Kendrick song, The Price is Paid. <laughs> anyway, um, one of the things that I really appreciated Floyd is he, his personality. Mm -hmm. For us as leaders, he was a warm person. And one thing that I can share about how Floyd was when he was speaking our celebration in Rosendahl, which was a main meeting. You've been there also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was waiting for him at the station. He was coming to with the train and I was waiting for him. And there was the train and everybody got, got, got out there. You couldn't miss Floyd, of course, but no Floyd. And then I saw the train passing by and there he was behind the window toward, talking to Warren Lancaster in a busy conversation. So passing by the station. So I had, to phone the, I had to phone the audience and say, well, sing a little bit more because they have to get up in Belgium and go back. <laughs> but Floyd was a man for people. And that was it with you as leaders. He was for us as leaders. He came to encourage us when he heard about our youngest son being born with this handicap. He came out and shared time to pray and just encourage us. And there are many examples of that, what he does, did for us. And Many of our young people, we have quite a number of young people in our church have seen some pass by, were uh, really encouraged by the ministry of YWAM and went to work with YWAM. And when I think about Floyd, this, these couple of days, uh, by the way, this morning I got a note from George Furrier. He's been in hospital just recently, and he shared about Floyd's passing away, that he was a leader. And when I think about Floyd and Sally, and about many of you, it's the words from Hebrews 11, 4. God's testifying about his gifts. It's about Abel and true faith. Though he is dead, he still speaks. And that's the great memory. Many people pass away and you never hear a thing or they got lost in books. But he is dead, but he still speaks. And I thank God for Floyd and Sally. And for many of you that I've seen tonight, I believe that's the, that's the legacy that we get. He still speaks. And thank you for this privilege to join you all. Thank you. 
Well, we've come to the end of the time where Floyd and Sally were living in uh, the, the Netherlands. 1991, they returned to the US uh, and started All Nations within YWAM. Later, that uh, became an independent ministry. Floyd then left YWAM to join uh, Metro Christian Fellowship, passed to that from 1999 to 2005, and six to, since 2006 have lived and worked in South Africa, pioneering All Nations ministry, sending workers across Africa and around the world. Judy Orrid, that is... Um, uh, Floyd is Judy's brother. I put it that way. All her life she's been Floyd's sister, of course, but Floyd is Judy's brother. Uh, joining us from Berlin, you've just uh, returned from America where you were with your other brother, Alan, uh, mm. when I believe you heard of um, that, that Floyd had passed on. Uh, so, Judy, thanks for joining us, and I believe you, we, you're going to bring us a greeting on behalf of the family. Yes, thank you, Jeff. You've done a marvelous job. Uh, you and Ramke are the most appropriate and fitting ones to create the weave of this story. And I'm just so grateful to you as Heidebeck and Amsterdam were both family gathering places for us as a family. So it's so meaningful. And so many of you knew my mother and father as well. Uh, Proverbs 25.2 says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and to search out a matter is to the glory of kings. And in these five, just over five years of Floyd's situation, we feel like so much has been concealed from us because there's so many unanswered questions. And yet in mining, or I should say excavating for purpose and meaning behind his illness and situation, we, particularly Sally, but others of us as well, we discovered something so precious in the mysteries of God. And I love what N.T. Wright says. He says that we find our footing in mystery and we have to live in it. And so the reason I've joined you, the main reason tonight is to say thank you to all of you who've walked this journey with us and with Sally when there were so many unanswered questions that we didn't understand. But you've been so faithful to pray for Floyd and Sally and our family. And we're just so grateful. And we wanted to express that to you tonight. So on behalf of both Floyd's extended family and Sally's extended family, Jim is here with me in Berlin and Alan and Trish in Tennessee. We wanna say thank you so very much. We're grateful beyond words to God, to Floyd and to all of you. So thank you for what this evening has meant. Thank you, Judy. We wanna thank you, Lord, for the richness of the testimonies shared tonight, bringing glory to you, thanking you that our lives have been able to be touched by a man named Floyd Lee McClung. And we pray a special grace on the whole family, but particularly Sally and Misha and Matthew at this stage. And uh, Lord, Give them the grace to put the unanswered questions on the side, as Judy was just saying. We thank you for the richness of this time together and for the gifts of hope and faith that you have given to us as we've heard these stories. In Jesus' name, amen. We're now going to give you the opportunity, if you uh, want to, to join a breakout group, uh, three breakout groups one, the original Dilaram phase up till 77, uh, then the Haderbeck phase up till 18, uh, 1980, and then the Amsterdam phase from there. I guess this is going to come up on a screen. I don't know how this works technically. Um, Mike uh, Stevens up in Sweden has been uh, behind the, the screen, and James Robinson here in Amsterdam helping us with all log logistics, as well as Adrian and Adriano. Thank you very much for all your help. And uh, this is the end of the formal session, and you are welcome to uh, connect with each other in these um, breakout groups now. Thank you for joining us. Good night.